Widow Bowen was getting old. She was seventy-five, perhaps, or eighty. No one in breath common really knew, but then it didn't really matter. She looked the same trim little person that she had always been, even while her husband, Ernest, had been alive, and he had died ten years ago. The little grey stone cottage on the hill lane up to the common was half hidden by damson trees from the road, and wrapped snugly, as if in a woollen comforter, by the flowering creeper which grew up beside the door. The round hawthorn hedge at the bottom of the garden by the road was neatly trimmed and looked like a long green sponge roll. At times the villagers expressed surprise and a little pride in the old lady when they saw how well kept the garden still was. It was a lot of work for an old woman, and a house-proud woman at that. Widow Bowen would just smile when the baker remarked on how strong and green her shallots were growing, or when Nurse Foley called up from the road with her laughing red face to say that the broad beans looked a picture. Widow Bowen would say, and her blue eyes would twinkle, I think I must have green fingers. Everything grows well here. And she thought she was being rather modest at that, for she could not remember anything that had not grown for her when she planted it. She would say the same thing to Mrs. Beddo at the farm when, in summer, she took down a basketful of long runner beans to help pay for the milk she fetched. I must have green fingers, she would say, and smile into Mrs. Beddo's sceptical face. Mrs. Beddo didn't quite know what to think. She didn't really want the vegetables that Widow Bowen brought in her basket, and yet neither did she want to show the old lady how mercenary she was by asking for money instead. So she just looked down at the white bobbed hair and placed the jug of milk carefully into the thin hands. Often, when Widow Bowen knelt polishing the red tiled step at her front door, she would pause and smile to herself, because the brass edge on the step and the kettle on the hob in the kitchen gleamed so brightly. There could not have been a brighter house on the common than hers, for Ernest and she had never had children, and she was a spotless housekeeper. But most of all she was pleased with the garden behind her, not a weed showing itself, and everything so very green and growing. Really, I must be very clever, she thought. She was not superstitious and wasn't sure at times that there was, in fact, a god in the sky. Often she would look up when it was blue, and couldn't see even a trace of him. But she felt that in some way she must have a gift. She would trot on her small feet around into the shade at the back of the house, and plant another cutting from the rose-tree near the lavatory, which had a seat scrubbed white as snow. I think I could make just anything grow she said to herself once, and to prove it she broke a twig off the old apple tree and stuck it into the ground. It was February, and the buds were still hard. Sure enough, in a week, the buds began to show green. She examined the twig each morning, and soon there were slender green shoots bursting out with a flare of leaf at their tips. She felt it was all so very simple. Indeed, they were only ordinary things that she planted, such as anyone on the common might grow. It wasn't enough for a person with really green fingers. So when the gardener from the big house in the valley walked by, up the hill, one Sunday afternoon, she stopped him at her gate and asked him in a quiet little voice if he would do her the kindness of bringing her a few bits of the tropical plants from the hothouses. He smiled at her thinking she couldn't possibly have anywhere to plant them, but promised. "'It'd be a pleasure, Mrs. Bowen,' he said, touching his cap. "'I'll find something for you.' And on the following Sunday he brought a chip basket to her door, filled with queer little bits of dark shiny leaves and pieces of cactus. "'Won't you come in and have a cup of tea?' she asked, smiling up at him. And though he was anxious to be off to his sister's house at the corner of the coppice, he took off his cap and bowed his head to go in under the low doorway. He blushed and mumbled, Thank you kindly, 
when she brought him sweet milky tea in a china cup with blackberries painted on it. He wet his finger on his tongue and dabbed up all the crumbs of the piece of faintly scented cake she placed by his arm. I can make those plants grow, she said, smoothing her hands on her black apron. Are you going to have them in pots indoors, then? he asked. Oh, no, she laughed carelessly. In the garden. They'll grow all right. I think you'll find it's too cold for them out there, he said. I could have brought you some proper outdoor plants if you'd said anything, only... No, these are just what I want. I want to try something really difficult for a change. He was puzzled a little, and when he had gone down the path and the gate had clicked behind him, she fetched her broom and tidied up the dust his boots had brought in. How are they growing? he asked with a secret sort of smile when he came up on the following Sunday. I've brought you a few more. Very nicely, she said, with a rather straight face, because she could see that he didn't quite believe her. That grey woolly one is in flower, she added, looking up at him from under her eyebrows. She watched his eyes open just a little wider. Come and see, she said, and took him along to the corner of the house. There they were against the wall, dark, shiny blue-green leaves, coloured fancy-patterned leaves, and on the grey woolly plant a deep wine-coloured flower. He lifted his cap and scratched his head thoughtfully, trying to work out how he had made a mistake. But he left his new lot of cuttings and took away his old basket, and determined to find something she wouldn't be able to grow for next week. Widow Bowen chuckled to herself as he went through the gate, and knelt down on the path to sort out the plants. "'They shall grow,' she said with her mouth held rather tight, and she puddled them into the soil with a little pot of rainwater. When she looked at them next morning, they had already begun to perk up and look settled. Fern fronds and spiky leaves reached out towards the wall of the house, and the narrow border had begun to look like a section of tropical jungle. "'I'll show that gardener what he knows about growing things,' she muttered as she scrubbed the lavatory seat, and it was with a little high-pitched laugh of triumph that she met him at the gate at the weekend. When he had gone, Widow Bowen wondered if she could have offended him, because he made no promise to bring anything more. She did not press him. She thought perhaps it was as well that she had finished with him. His plants grew so very easily. She even had a sense of having wasted time, and she pressed the roots of the delicate trailing creeper he had brought into the ground with an off-hand dig of her thin fingers. She said to Mrs. Beddow the next morning when she went to fetch her jug of milk, "'You know, I really believe I could make a stick of firewood grow.' The woman looked at her with uncertain eyes and felt that perhaps Widow Bowen was going a little dotty in her old age. It was not altogether surprising after losing her husband and living on her own all the time. The old lady understood the look, but she did not care very deeply. Mrs. Beddow's thoughts did not worry her, and as she sat knitting by her fire in the evening, she said, "'Well, and why not? A stick of firewood had to grow at one time or another.' And she decided to try it. No harm could come of it, after all. "'If it doesn't grow, perhaps it will stop me being a conceited old woman for a bit.' But in spite of this she laughed in her throat as she thought of the gardener and his tropical plants. "'Oh, the look on his face!' She laughed until a tear fell on her knitting. She had been buying bundles of chopped firewood from the shop up the hill for more than a month. Her tree prunings had all been used up, and she was too nervous of the dark coppice to fetch sticks from there, so it was a piece of the shop firewood that she took out into the garden the following morning. She shook her head over it as she carried it around to the back of the house. "'I really am stupid,' she thought. "'It looks dead as a doornail.' She couldn't decide what sort of wood it was, either. The grain was very straight and soft, nothing like apple or damsonwood. wood. 
As she bent down to press it into the ground, she looked around carefully for fear someone might be watching her. Then they would think I'm mad, she said loudly to make herself feel better. She stood back and looked at the stick in the ground, holding her soiled hands away from her sides. It stuck up out of the earth like a long, thin bar of yellow soap cut off smartly at the top. For a moment she seriously considered the possibility that she might be going mad, and then she hurried away to put the potatoes on for dinner. The delicate creeper grew just as if she had planted it with the utmost care, just as though it were in its native climate, and she stopped bothering about her tropical plants. When no one was passing up the lane, and she thought she was unobserved, she would hurry around to the back of the house, up past the rainwater butt, to look at her piece of firewood. Each time she went she felt more and more silly. After three days had gone by and she couldn't see any change, she was tempted to pull it up and have done with the whole business. But then it rained hard for three or four days, so that she was hardly able to go out of the house at all. She sat at her window and watched the mist of the rain sweeping up the valley. When she got tired of that, she would put on the headphones of Ernest's crystal set and sit listening to the radio program. And she cleaned and polished the house from top to bottom until she could see her wrinkled little face in the shine on the floor tiles. Only when the rain had stopped and she was able to go out into the garden again did she realize how long she had been cooped up. Little specks of chickweed and groundsel were dotting the spaces between her rows of peas and onions. She put on her leather-topped clogs and went to work with the rake. The piece of firewood was completely forgotten. It was only when she took a steaming hot bucket of water and a scrubbing brush up the steps outside the back door to scour the lavatory seat that it came to mind. When she saw it, she set down her bucket with a clank. Flaky brown bark had covered up the yellow wood, and the chipped-off top was now a beautifully pointed spear, a shoot, reaching nearly a foot high, with a small arrowhead of pale green pine needles at its top. Then she said, Well, of course, I knew it would, and picked up her bucket and went into the lavatory to scrub the seat. But when she had finished and dried the woodwork off with a steaming cloth, she examined her new plant carefully. It was a little thick around the base, perhaps, but a very pretty little tree for all that. She looked around to see if anyone was watching, but the house was a perfect screen from the road, and the damson trees in the top corner of the orchard hid her effectively from all the cottages higher up the hill. A sudden feeling of elation filled her, so that she picked up her bucket and almost danced down the steps into her small kitchen. Over and over again she sang, I've got green fingers, to a tune that came into her head, and she got out a small pot of honey for tea. Next morning, while she was washing in the kitchen, she studied her face in the mirror. Your hair wants cutting, she said, "'suddenly noticing some stray pieces that had become rather long. "'Before she coiled her hair into its bob and pinned it, "'she fetched her best scissors from the sewing-basket in the window "'and cut the wisps of her hair carefully. "'Really, you still look quite pretty,' she said to the glass, "'and twisted the corners of her mouth into a mocking little smile. "'For a few seconds she stood daydreaming "'with the puffs of white hair in her hand.' Then, coming to with a start, she went out to the dark little patch of earth at the back and pressed the hair together in a little tuft in the ground. The tree was growing fast. It was many inches higher, and shoots had begun to press out all round the sides of it. Suddenly she was worried in case it should become a large tree, because the small kitchen window needed all the light it could get. If it grows too big, she said firmly, I shall have to chop it down. And with that she went back into the house and put on the kettle for her morning cup of tea. She began to say less and less to Mrs. Beddo when she went down for her milk. She took money now and refrained from offering the woman vegetables. She knew that if she mentioned her garden now she wouldn't be believed, 
the tuft of hair was growing tall and bushy, and new sprouts of golden brown were coming up from the bottom. She couldn't possibly tell Mrs. Beddo that. By the middle of summer she was becoming a little uneasy. The tropical creeper was growing all up the end wall of the house, and was beginning to push back her own wisteria. She had tried to cut it back, but it only seemed to shoot out more strongly. The bush of hair needed trimming every few days, or it hung over the path in great curling locks, and the piece of firewood was now a strong tree over seven feet tall. She was worried, too, by the little accidents she had been having. They depressed her. The first had happened when she clipped back the climbing plant. Being a tiny woman, she was unable to reach the higher tentacles it shot out, and she fetched a chair to stand on. As she reached high to cut the last spray, the chair tipped sideways and she fell, twisting her ankle, so that for a few days it was swollen and painful. While she was hobbling about with this, she tried to twist off one of the branches of the young tree because it was reaching out in front of the lavatory door. A tuft of pine needles caught her in the eye so that she believed for a few painful moments that it had blinded her. She had hardly recovered from these injuries when she scratched her leg deeply with the point of the shears while she was clipping the bush of hair. As she said to the baker when he called, I've been knocking myself about lately. But pushing things into the ground had become a habit with her. Any little pieces of wood or vegetable peelings she had, she pressed into the ground behind the house. In time, they all began to grow, and the small hidden patch of earth was becoming a flourishing little garden of mixed odds and ends. She wondered at times whether the lack of sun behind the house might not prevent some of her experiments from doing well, but the various growths seemed to prefer the shade. Thinking of the hair that had grown, she pushed into the soil one day a piece of broken fingernail that she had cut off. It grew up like a long, slender leaf, milky white and swaying in the wind. At times, when she stood and watched it, there seemed to be something mocking and truculent about it. She had the feeling that it, and the other things too, were returning a challenge that she had thrown down by sticking them into the soil. It increased her uneasiness, but she couldn't stop herself doing it. She swung between moods of triumphant success and timid disgust. It was about the time when her leg had finally healed that she noticed something sticking out of her little plot of earth that had not been there a few days before. She racked her brains to remember what she could possibly have planted, but she could think of nothing, and she couldn't quite see what it was that was growing. It wasn't green, certainly. It seemed to be a small brown knob covered with a thin, greyish slime. Oh, a toadstool, I expect, she said and went off up the road to the shop. But on the way back with her groceries and firewood, a thought suddenly struck her. The gamekeeper from the big house had brought her a rabbit the week before, and rather than suffer the smell of burning the bones, she had buried them. But I never meant those to be planted, she said aloud as she hurried down the lane. Not to grow! Without stopping to put her shopping basket indoors, she hastened round to the back of the house and peered closely again at the new thing. At last she decided that it was in fact one of the rabbit bones, but rather high out of the ground, and looking very sticky and wet. It was ugly, too, and she drew her hand back quickly when she realised that she had just been about to touch it. The next day she refused to look at it as she went past. Indeed, for a few days she managed to half convince herself that if she ceased to show any more interest in her experiments, they would stop growing. After all, she said, it's me that has the green fingers, not them. But at last she could not curb her curiosity, and she went to examine the thing. There was more of it out of the ground by this time. The slimy covering had dried a little, and there were thin red lines running criss-cross all over it. Right down near the ground, a fine grey mould had begun to form, 
Gradually she accommodated herself to the idea. There were soon three more shoots near the first, all beginning to reach up to the same height. The grey mould had become thick and fluffy, growing nearly to the tops of the stems, which were beginning to spread out so much in the manner of tall toadstools that she began to think her first idea had been the right explanation. And yet their centres remained pink and milky, unlike any toadstool she'd ever seen. When her damsons were ripe, Widow Bowen spent all her time picking and packing them off to market. She refused all the offers of the menfolk of the village to help with the ladder work. And so, for a few weeks, her secret garden was forgotten. By the beginning of October, many of her plants had died off, and the leaves on the various young trees had turned yellow. Even the bush of hair had begun to slow in its growth, and she was able to gather up handfuls of the trailing fronds and lay them back from the path onto the garden. The four grey plants had spread right out at the top until they met, and they were growing one thick bulbous blob on top of them all. "'There's no doubt about it,' she said quietly as she stood looking at it. "'It's them rabbit bones!' What would that smarty gardener say if I showed him this? She couldn't imagine. It was the last thing in the world she would have dreamed of mentioning to anyone. By the time winter came, all signs of pink in the peculiar animal plant had been covered up by the grey fur, and the rough form of the animal had become apparent. Widow Bowen was not always sure in the full light of the late afternoons whether she imagined it, or whether the form did actually twitch, as it appeared to do. At last, in early January, the snow came and hung in sheets on the branches of the pine tree. The whole of her cottage was lit up with the whiteness of the snow outside. Only the top of the rabbit plant was visible, but short ears had begun to sprout, and now, definitely, she noticed that there was some movement in the snow. It was this that disturbed her far more than the growth itself, though she did not know why. For nearly a fortnight she woke each morning to find it had snowed in the night, and she would stand at her bedroom window and look out across the valley with its fields, trees, everything, covered in white. Then she would look down sadly at her paths and know that she must put on stockings over her shoes and go out with tingling fingers to sweep. One morning the snow was marked with little black dots leading down to the hedge. She knew at once what they were, and because she knew she was shocked. She hurried out to the back of the house with a fearful choking in her throat. It was gone. There was a black hole in the snow and four imprints in the damp earth beneath. She stood a long time, two days to think. When at last she was able to think, her thoughts frightened her so much that she ran back into the house and did not venture out again all day. She sat huddled in her chair by the empty fireplace, too frightened to move, and did not think of eating. She slept there that night. Next morning the sun shone fiercely and the snow began to melt. Widow Bowen stirred herself and laid the fire. The sunlight shone into her room, and everything seemed cheerful once more. She thought carefully about her fears, and the more she thought, the more silly they appeared. It's gone. I'm well rid of it. With that she began to clean up the house and sweep the slushy snow away from her door. By afternoon nearly all the snow had gone. I've been worried more than enough by all these growing things she said firmly. I'm going to lay my axe at the butt of the tree. It's darkened my window long enough. The axe was heavy and sharp. Milk-white chips of wood jumped out onto the earth as she chopped at the small V-shaped cut she had made in the trunk, and after a few minutes she was very hot and tired. She stood up with the branches all about her head, looking at her little cottage. For the first time in many years she wished that Ernest were still alive. Chopping this small tree down would have been nothing to him, 
It was less than four inches across the bottom, but she had made very little progress. At her second attempt, she steadied herself by resting her left hand low down on the trunk and swung the axe slowly with one hand, letting the weight of the head do the work. The chips were smaller now, and the neat V had become a ragged notch in the white wood. She felt that she was going to expend all her energy without cutting more than halfway through it, and with a burst of determination she began to hack fiercely at it, so that the blood came to her bowed head, making her feel a little dizzy. The end of the haft caught her bent knee as she swung the axe. With a sickening pain, the blade swung up into her hand on the trunk. She fell down in a faint, with the blood spurting from the stump of her forefinger. When her vision cleared, she knew what had happened. She felt weak and knew that the bleeding must be stopped. There was no pain now, only a dull numbness all up her arm. She crawled shakily to her feet and tottered uncertainly down the steps into her kitchen. She found a piece of white cloth and wrapped it around her bleeding hand. She felt old, very old, and wanted to die. Soon the blood was soaking through the cloth, and she realized that she needed a doctor, or she would indeed die very soon. She stirred herself and went down to the front gate, holding her bandaged hand up in front of her like a dog with a lame paw. Her neighbor's little boy was circling in the lane on his bicycle, and she called weakly to him to ride down the hill and ask the nurse to come quickly in her little car. When the nurse came, Widow Bowen was leaning on the gate for support, with the blood dripping from her bandage. Nurse Foley took one look at the hand and carried the old lady into the back of her car. Then she set off for the town hospital. It was only when they were driving back in the dark that Widow Bowen truly woke up to what had happened to her. A huge white pad of bandage held her mutilated hand firmly bound. "'You must take things easy for a week or so,' said Nurse Foley, half turning her red face to the back seat. "'You've lost a lot of blood, you know. I asked them if they could keep you in for a few days, but they just haven't got a bed to spare.' Widow Bowen smiled weakly and said she felt very well, considering. But there was something troubling her at the back of her mind. "'Shall I ask Mrs. Jones to come in and help you get your tea?' the nurse asked when she had taken the old lady in and lit the lamp for her. "'I think I can manage well enough one-handed,' said Widow Bowen, and her blue eyes twinkled a little again now that she was back home. To prove it, she made a cup of tea for herself and the nurse, and sat gazing at the big round-faced woman in her sitting-room. The tea made her feel a lot better, and she brought out some scones and put a light to the laid fire in the grate. She felt quite safe with the house round her. At last the nurse went, promising to call in the morning, and the old woman sat thinking in her chair. Her fingers. Her precious green fingers were irrevocably damaged. Slowly she got up and walked, carrying the lamp, out through the kitchen to the back of the house. Little splashes of blood had dried in a trail across the kitchen floor. She stood in the wavering light of the lamp, looking at the hacked tree with the chips of white wood lying all round it, and felt very sorry that she had tried to cut it down. She could sympathise now that the axe had cut her too. The axe lay at the foot of the tree with a little stain of blood on the blade. Suddenly, in the chippings, she saw a finger, bent and white. Her stomach lurched and she felt a bit dizzy again. Wondering, she stooped and set her lamp down and picked up the finger and looked at it. It looked so old and wrinkled and white. Many times she had pressed holes into the earth with it for seedlings, and now it was cut off. She held it against her breast, crying a little. It looked so forlorn. And you'll never plant another thing, she sobbed sadly to it. 
as though it were a dead child. The frustrated maternal instincts of years welled up in her small bent body, and she nursed this small part of her close in the warmth of her dress. After standing there a long while, with the lamp at her feet throwing up the shadows all around her, she said with sudden determination, "'You shan't die. I'll put you in the ground and you shall grow.' In spite of her resolve, her heart was beating rapidly as she stepped on to the garden and crouched down in the darkness behind the rose-bush at the side of the lavatory. With tears pooling in her eyes, she made a hole in the ground and placed her finger in it. For minutes she crouched brooding over this strange child of her body until her legs ached with cramp, and then she went into the house and up to bed. Many times in the night she woke crying with the pain in her hand, and when the morning came she was pale and worn out. Nurse Foley suggested that a woman should come in and look after her for a few days, but the old woman refused fiercely. The nurse sighed and said, Very well. She tucked the stray ends of her grey hair into her cap and left. Widow Bowen went round to the back of the house to look at her finger. The dew of the night had taken all the limpness out of it. It was pointed straight up at the sky and had a tinge of colour again around the knuckles. A wave of defiant will flowed through her and then left her feeling weary and apathetic. She was no longer surprised. It was difficult for her even to think clearly about it. The thing was growing. She only felt that at all costs she must prevent anyone from ever seeing it. In a few days there were the tips of other fingers showing. The old lady nodded her white head tiredly when she saw them. She felt it was all out of her control now. In a fortnight a full hand had appeared. Fear began to fill the old widow. She wandered about her cottage in a vague dream. The brass doorknob began to discolour and the kettle grew tarnished and blackened. Crumbs of food lay on the floors, and a fine film of dust was thickening on her sideboard. Out in the garden the unplanted earth had a thin carpet of weeds, and the hedge at the roadside grew woolly. Often she forgot to go for her milk, and cried peevishly one morning when Mrs. Beddoe brought it up to her. For many days at a time she was too frightened to go and look at the growing thing in the shadows behind her house, but eventually she would have to go, and would stand staring at it with a glaze over her blue eyes. A wrist and an arm had appeared, with the skin wrinkled slightly, like her own, and by the time the cherries blossomed, the crest of a white head had begun to appear, like the top of a large horse mushroom. She would spend hours staring at it with a terrible fascination. The fear that anyone should see it became an obsession with her. She began to meet the baker at the gate to prevent him from walking up to the house, and she covered the naked head and shoulder over with brown potato sacks. The eyes of the figure were closed, but on the face and the bare shoulders were the wrinkles and freckles that resembled her own in the minutest detail. Night after night she lay tossing in a half-stupor of sleep, while horrible dreams flashed through her frightened mind. By the time the damsons were ripe, the white body was out of the ground to its knees, bent slightly forward, as she herself stood. Widow Bowen let her damsons rot on the trees. Birds settled in screaming crowds, pecking at the decaying fruit, and as the season passed over, Shriveled brown drops remained to hang like tiny bats from all the branches. The cottage was now thick in dirt, and the forest of weeds in the garden had already begun to die down. The hawthorn hedge had sprung up unchecked, hiding the house from the view of the villagers, and but for her occasional dishevelled appearance at the gate to wait for the baker, they would have believed her to be dead. At first they had inquired whether they might lend a hand in the house or garden, but she answered them with such hysterical outbursts that they stopped asking, and hurried past her gate with heads down whenever she happened to be standing there. 
As December passed, the snow came again, bearing down the tall raggedness of the hedge, and settling like a mantle on the sack-covered shoulders of the growing figure behind the house. Mornings would come, and the old lady would wake from her fitful sleep to find the room flooded with white light from the blanket of snow outside. She dreaded it. Each morning she expected to see a dark trail leading across the garden from the back of the house, as she had done the year before. But each morning the snow stretched, untouched, down to the hedge, startlingly white. Every day she would take a quick, frightened look behind the rambling rose-tree beside the lavatory, to be sure the figure still stood there. At times it would sway a little, and Widow Bowen would stand, rigid with horror, until it was still again. The lavatory seat was no longer white. Cobwebs and dusty bits of newspaper littered its once scrubbed surface. Widow Bowen was almost too frightened to go in there, for fear of the figure outside. The snow still covered the ground in a hard-frozen layer when she came out of the lavatory late one afternoon and took her usual hurried look behind the rose-bush. Her heart stopped beating for a second, and the breath choked in her throat. Two black patches of soil were all that remained to show where it had been. She looked wildly about her. With a terrified scream, she stumbled down the steps into her kitchen and slammed the door behind her. She bolted it at top and bottom with dithering fingers and scurried into the sitting-room to lock the front door. There, in her chair, sat the figure, staring at her. She stood with her back against the door, unable to move. The other did not move either. It was her exact double, from the white hair to the twinkling blue eyes, but clothed, almost demurely, in sacks. The old lady stared at the white thin hands spread out on the arms of the chair. The fingers were complete, whole. Widow Bowen looked up into the eyes again. They looked into hers with a faint, mocking smile, as though they could see into the deepest corners of her mind. She was rigid with terror. The blood began to leave her head. A gradual blackness clouded out her sight, and she sank to the floor, unconscious. Nurse Foley came down the hill in her car next morning. The snow had almost melted in the night, and the sun was shining. Catching sight of the old lady, she stopped and put her head out. "'I'm glad to see you trimming your hedge,' she said. "'It had begun to look untidy.' The old lady smiled, holding the shears in front of her. "'Yes,' she said. "'The whole place is in a terrible mess. I've been dying to get started on it. But the snow held me up, you know.' Her blue eyes twinkled brightly. "'I suppose you've heard the news,' said the nurse, pushing her head farther out of the window. "'No, I haven't. What's that, then?' "'Oh, my dear, I've been up there for hours. They found a body in the coppice, you know. Little Chris Bradley found it first. At least, a piece of it. Horrible it is, all chopped to pieces with an axe or something.' The police are there now. They think it's probably an old woman, but it's so wickedly smashed about they can't recognise anything. What a nasty thing! Oh, terrible, yes. Still, you don't want to bother your head about that. You've had enough trouble. How is your hand going on? She looked from one hand to the other, confused between left and right. But there was no missing finger. Oh, beautifully, said the old lady, smiling and nodding her head. Everything grows well here. I think I must have green fingers. <laughs>